Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. For much of the Biden administration, the Pentagon was seeking to de-emphasize the role of the U.S. military in the Middle East and to grow cooperation between Middle Eastern militaries. The Hamas attacks of October 7th and the subsequent Israeli assault on Gaza profoundly changed the U.S. military's focus in the Middle East, and it also changed perceptions of the U.S. role. To talk about the U.S. defense strategy in the Middle East before and after the conflict in Gaza, I speak with Dana Stroll, who left the Pentagon in December after three years as the building's senior Middle East expert. We talk about her experiences in the Pentagon, how the conflict has changed U.S. security partnerships with Arab states and what stayed the same and what lessons Israel should take from U.S. military experiences in the region. Then I speak with Natasha Hall and Leah Hickert about the ways in which the war is a multidimensional policy problem for the United States and the timeline for U.S. government action. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Dana Stroll is the director of research at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Until December, she was the deputy assistant secretary of defense for the Middle East, the most senior civilian in the Pentagon looking at the region. Before that, she worked in think tanks, she worked on Capitol Hill, and she previously worked in the Pentagon in the same office that she led. Dana, welcome to Babel. Thanks so much, John. Pleasure to be with you today. So as you were leading the Middle East shop in the Pentagon, where was the Middle East fitting into the broader U.S. strategy in the world? So I think we should go back to the beginning of the administration, the Biden administration's national security strategy and national defense strategy. It talks about China as the major strategic competitor The next threat that the national defense strategy identified was Russia. So for our partners in the Middle East, I think they heard that and said the United States, and particularly this administration, was deprioritizing the Middle East. And what senior leaders articulated in early 2021 and throughout 2022 is that the U.S. remained invested and committed to this part of the world. But it was going to do it in different ways. So it was going to focus on diplomacy, not military solutions. It was going to emphasize de-escalating and winding down conflicts, working with key partners and allies to address political processes and long-term sustainable solutions for those conflicts. It was going to emphasize investing in humanitarian response for civilians in need in places like Yemen and Syria and elsewhere. And the path to stability and security in the Middle East was going to be through integration. So here, there's been a lot of talk about this idea of integrated deterrence. And what it means is that from a U.S. approach, a whole of government approach to addressing problems and coordinating across all of our allies and partners. So combat credible investments in militaries, military equipment, military exercising, exchanges of information and training, but also coordinating economically, diplomatically in the information space, all of this together. And so Mike Tyson famously said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. We had a plan, we were executing a plan, and then a lot of things changed. How did that feel in the Middle East shop where we had all these strategic ideas to not be as militarily involved. And then suddenly we were deeply militarily involved. First of all, I'll share one story. One of my bosses was asked in early 2022, how many meetings does the National Security Council have per week on a Middle East related issue? And the answer in 2022 is maybe there were one or two a month. Obviously, October 7th changed all of that. And then we were having meetings at the National Security Council on a near daily basis. And somebody like me in charge of just the Middle East region and the Pentagon was seeing Secretary Austin on a daily basis. And developments in the Middle East 
were absolutely top of the inbox for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, for the National Security Advisor, for the Secretary of State. So absolutely, best laid plans have changed. And I think what is lost on a lot of critics of how the administration approached the Middle East in the first and second years of the administration is that we actually demonstrated that our strategy is agile and flexible enough to respond to emerging crises and circumstances. So yes, American leaders and officials here in Washington were focusing on other issues, but they have absolutely been able to shift focus, exercise those diplomatic muscles, increase defense posture in the Middle East, surge military equipment to support Israel, and prevent all-out regional war And to date, that is what happened. The U.S. invested a lot in trying to increase communication between partner militaries in the region, including with the Israelis who are now part of CENTCOM. What kinds of things have you seen since October 7th that you thought reflected investments that the U.S. had made? What kinds of investments had you made that have to be paused because of the real outrage in the Arab world over Israel's conduct in this war? So I wouldn't call myself an optimist, but here is actually where I think there is silver lining. So let's go back to what I said earlier about integrated deterrence. Part of that is allies and partners making certain investments that benefit everyone's security as well as the broader security. So investing in kinds of equipment that can do shared air defense, What is one of the most pressing immediate security challenges of the Middle East? It's Iranian development of lethal one-way attack drones. And everybody needs to be prepared for this. And it turns out the best way to be prepared is not to focus only on your borders, but to create a networked system for early warning, to share intelligence, and to expand your air picture. So those are the kinds of things that the Department of Defense has been working on with our partners in the Middle East. And Israel's in the Middle East, and certainly by sharing its technology, its intelligence, and the ways in which it detects threats to its population and its willingness to share that with partners, everyone's security can be enhanced. So that work was going on before October 7th. The other big initiative of the Department of Defense is not just in the integrated air and missile defense, but in building coalitions to address security threats. And here, a good example is what our Navy headquarters, NAVSENT, in the Middle East is doing. They have something called the Combined Maritime Forces. Dozens of nations, not just of the Middle East, but all over the world, come together. Ships, sailors, intelligence experts, analysts, liaison officers. There are 41 countries in Combined Maritime Forces, as I understand it. Absolutely. And what they're doing is addressing all the different threats and challenges at sea, piracy, terrorism, illicit trafficking of people, illicit trafficking of weapons, Red Sea security, etc. The military and intelligence coordination between the United States and our partners, including Israel, remains very resilient today. There are not partners in the Middle East who say, even if I am exceptionally frustrated and disappointed in the level of humanitarian suffering in Gaza, it's no longer in my security interest to share intelligence and cooperate on air and missile defense across the region and with Israel. So that architecture remains. And then if you look at examples like Operation Prosperity Guardian, which is a presence and monitoring mission in the Red Sea stood up by the United States with partners. And then you look at the separate coalition strikes to degrade Houthi capabilities and infrastructure and take weapons off the table so that the Houthis cannot threaten Red Sea maritime security. These are all examples where the U.S. convened and led a security architecture actually still working to this day. So, as you know, there are only... I think 10 or 11 countries that have announced they're part of Prosperity Guardian. I spoke to the French and Egyptian embassies, and they said, well, we're part of this combined maritime forces. We're part of Task Force 153. We don't really understand why there needs to be Prosperity Guardian, and we're not a part of it. What's the 
point of having this separate coalition, especially when it seemed that we couldn't get other countries that are affected to join our coalition. They said the work is already ongoing as part of another thing. And by the way, we want to have nothing to do with any of your strikes. So this is an example where what the United States brings to the table is a convening authority. And where I think the nomenclature has confused some people. So Operation Prosperity Guardian is a temporary task force under this broader structure intended to address a pressing near-term imminent threat. So we tell partners, especially under the combined maritime forces, come as you are, contribute what you can. Not everyone can contribute the same thing. Different navies have different investments, different capabilities, different levels of priority, different sizes, different funding levels, et cetera. First of all, just being a member of these organizations sends a signal of international commitment, which is important, especially when signaling to adversaries. And I would say the other thing that's important to understand about how the United States does this work is that you are right, John, not every government and not every Navy and not every military wants to be publicly associated with every U.S.-led effort. And we're adaptable and flexible to that. So there's a lot of countries who don't want their names on certain lists that are still contributing because most people recognize that Iran-backed Houthi aggression challenging one of the world's most critical strategic waterways is in nobody's interest. But it still seems to me that countries that agree it's not in their interest also say it's not in our interest to align with the United States. When France was part of Prosperity Guardian, France said we're part of Prosperity Guardian, but we won't be under U.S. command. As you know, there's a separate European Union task force that just got stood up under Greek command, which operates in parallel with Prosperity Guardian. But there seems to be this reluctance to be too closely associated with the United States to certainly benefit from the United States. That's a fair point. And clearly one of the animating challenges at this moment in time is that our allies and partners perceive the United States to have supported Israel in what they view to be an unacceptable level of civilian casualties in Gaza and have contributed and affected this terrible humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And because the Houthis and other Iran-backed groups wrap themselves in the mantle of defending the Palestinian cause, that has prompted some of our partners to seek to put public distance between themselves and their capitals and the United States. And that's something the United States is going to have to work through. On the other hand, the reality is that The Biden administration has been very focused on avenues to expand humanitarian aid delivery, to secure the release of hostages, and to get to a ceasefire. And this is, again, the silver lining for somebody who's rarely optimistic, is that nobody in the Middle East or Europe is saying there's no role for the United States in addressing peace, security, and stability in the Middle East. So if we want to talk about stabilizing Gaza, if we want to talk about increasing humanitarian aid to Gaza, just look at the work the U.S. military is doing now on standing up a maritime option on the airdrops. All the other countries and their airdrops into Gaza, they don't happen without the U.S. military. If it comes to confronting other forms of Iranian aggression, there's no one saying we can do this without the United States. So I think that there is significant frustration and tension that we will need to work through with our partners, but no one questions the value added of U.S. military contributions, U.S. diplomats, and what we can bring to bear in terms of resourcing to address the very serious crises that are roiling the region today. So I want to get to Iran, but first I want to focus on this issue of partners. You spent a lot of time trying to build partner relationships in the region after you were at it for three years. What do you think partners just continue not to understand? What's the piece of the equation you really wish you could convince them of that they don't get yet? One of the most common complaints I heard from our partners was that the United States 
can't be trusted or is unreliable because our policy changes too much based on who's in the White House. And I think that's fair. I think there's certainly been very significant swings and there's been disagreements about many policy objectives and what different administrations identified as achievements of their administration. But at its core, I think what some of our partners are saying is that we don't like democracy because every four to eight years, you guys are going to change and I'm going to have to get used to a new team and new policies and understand the new players. And that is different from some of our partners who are not democracies. And they don't especially like democracies. They don't want democracies in the Middle East. As I've certainly heard, and I'm sure you have heard. Absolutely. I think what I try to convey and hope to continue to convey in my conversations is that there's actually a lot of consistency in administration policies, even though you have such significant swings in personalities, leadership styles, and priorities. So a few examples. Every president has maintained the rather significant U.S. military presence in the Middle East. No president has shut down any of our very significant air bases in the Middle East. No president has stopped the preponderance of U.S. military and economic aid that goes to the Middle East. The top recipients globally are all in the Middle East, except in the last two years, Ukraine. Our best ambassadors, our most sophisticated military equipment, our resources, and the investment in people, personnel, our young men and women, is going to the Middle East. And there actually haven't been considerable changes in that investment. And so while I think a lot of leaders focus on the rhetoric either coming from our Congress or from the White House, the investments have actually remained relatively stable. And I think our partners are going to have to get used to the idea that we're going to change every four to eight years and that democracies and elected members of the U.S. government and in the U.S. Congress are responsive to American constituents and American voters, and they have use on how our precious resources and where our service members should go, and that's different than a non-democratic system of government. I'm sure there were things that continued to puzzle you after being in this job. What do you wish you understood about our partners? What are the mysteries that, with all the resources you had, Did you just have a hard time wrapping your head around? So there was a point in 2022 when I was worried that our partnerships in the Middle East were going to unravel. And it came down to what many in Washington saw as equivocating on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So here... In Washington, I think our cabinet level officials and people inside the administration and the U.S. Congress were working to hold the line is that if you don't stop this kind of aggression in Europe, it will certainly embolden adversaries in other theaters that might think the world isn't going to muster the political will and the resources to defend in another theater if an adversary seeks to use force to remake borders. And clearly, I'm talking about China and Asia Pacific and about Iran in the Middle East. So from a Washington, D.C. perspective, I think people saw it in a very clear black and white way and that surely our partners in the Middle East would make a decision to stand on the right side of history because the rules-based international order benefits our partners in the Middle East, and they should want to uphold that order. And secondly, when you look to the China example, there's ample evidence out there that 5G systems coming from Huawei or military purchases coming from Beijing actually is a form of leverage now that Beijing may seek to cash in on later. And for our partners who care so much about their sovereignty, why wouldn't you take certain actions to insulate your security, your sovereignty, or the U.S. partnership by taking certain actions to impose costs on Russia 
or to say to China, these are certain areas where we're not going to work with you because it threatens our partnership with the United States. So I think our partners hear that and say, this isn't a zero sum game. I'm not going to pick. And I actually think from a Washington perspective, we said we're not asking you to pick, but there are categories of activities where we are asking you to take a firm stance. And in many cases, our partners aren't taking that stance and they're pursuing what they believe to be their own interests in their own way. And I think we just have difference of views of what's in their security interests. And so I'll tie it all in a bow now. Russia is not a European problem. <laughs> Russia is now continuing to target and kill Ukrainians and Ukrainian civilian infrastructure with weapons supplied from Iran. And the Russians are also turning to Pyongyang and the North Koreans for weapons. And we know that the Chinese are contemplating also supplying the Russians. So there's an emerging access of Russian, Iranian, Chinese, North Korean cooperation and coordination that challenges the very nature of a world order that most of us have benefited from. I'm sure you got an earful. There's a perception that Israel is using American weapons to destroy Gazan infrastructure to kill tens of thousands of Palestinians with, at best, indifference to civilian suffering. And, and certainly there are more contentious assessments of what the Israelis are doing with continued American support. And that when we talk about a rules-based order, that there's profound hypocrisy in the U.S. side for saying a rules-based order applies to the way Russia conducts a war, but it doesn't apply to the way Israel conducts a war. I've certainly heard a lot of that. I'm sure you've heard even more. What I haven't heard is a persuasive rebuttal that the United States recognizes that tension and is actively moving to resolve it. So I think that that's how many of our partners see it. And I think that's a very convenient narrative about what's happening for our partners. So the point of U.S. partnership is that we don't abandon our partners. Russia unprovoked decision to declare war and invade Ukraine. That's not what happened in Gaza and Israel. First, there was a vicious and unprecedented Hamas terror attack in Israel. Number two is that the U.S. can walk and chew gum at the same time. So yes, there are significant concerns here in Washington and having sat in a lot of these meetings with the Biden administration officials, absolutely concerned about the humanitarian situation and the level of civilian casualties. But the way to address that is not to break a partnership or stop all military support to that partner. And frankly, most of our partners have experienced that same tension in Washington policy. So we could talk about the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. The United States never abandoned our partners who were seeking to restore the legitimate government in Yemen, despite accusations that that's what happened. We also stood up a significant coalition in Iraq and Syria and exercised and articulated very serious concerns about the ways in which aspects of those campaigns were executed. But the United States doesn't just abandon a partner, and there is nuance in that approach. And the other part of what you're saying, I think, without question, there should be concern by our partners about the civilian casualties and the humanitarian toll. But what they don't say publicly and they're willing to talk about privately is that they want Hamas to be dismantled and that no military has confronted the nature of the operational challenge that the Israel Defense Forces have in Gaza. And I think privately a lot of them recognize that in any of the campaigns that they undertook, they weren't dealing with a terrorist organization that had close to 20 years to dig a network of terror tunnels and completely embed itself in the civilian infrastructure and fabric of Gaza. So as a final area of discussion, it seems to me that for much of your career in this space, how the U.S. thinks about victory has probably changed. I think we started off in 2003. We thought we were going to have a clean victory in Iraq. We thought we were going to have a clean victory in Afghanistan. We've had not only a whole series of different postures in Iraq, we've been involved in Syria. And now we're looking at a close ally, Israel, which says we have to have victory because victory is necessary to our survival. As you think about how the U.S. has changed the way 
it thinks about victory. Do you think we've come to any sort of conclusions or any of those relevant to the Gaza environment? I do. And the most clear articulation that comes to mind is Secretary Austin at the Reagan National Security Forum last year in December. And what he talked about is Israel's focus on tactical victory while losing the strategic war. And what he meant by that is we have had to reconceptualize what victory looks like. It is not clear, it's muddy, and it's messy. And frankly, in areas where we've had significant boots on the ground fighting terrorist forces like ISIS or like Al-Qaeda, I think how the story ends is actually still being told now in a place like Iraq and certainly in a place like Syria and Afghanistan is another one. But what we in the United States have learned is that there is no victory that's military only. And if you do not attend to the needs of the population and immediately begin planning for when the active part of a campaign ends. What happens in that space immediately after the fighting ends, before you can do major reconstruction, before you clear out the rubble? If you're not thinking and planning for that, then victory is absolutely at risk. And so a a lot of the conversation, I think, is being actively had with Israel now is what is militarily necessary or sufficient so that Hamas cannot return to have a governing stranglehold on Gaza. But if you do not prioritize the needs of the civilians in Gaza, then Israel's security will never be assured either. And I think those are some tough lessons that we in the U.S. military learned. So an idea we hear from a lot of Israelis that we're not going to deal with the day after right now, we just want to focus on degrading Hamas, is actually not the way to achieving anything that will deliver security for Israel. What I hear more from Israelis is we've been in conflict with Palestinians for a century, and the Americans have an idea that there's a way to undermine Palestinian hostility. And the Israeli view is, for the most part, we're going to have to manage enduring Palestinian hostility and make sure that they never have the ability to challenge Israel. How do we deal with a partner that just doesn't accept the idea that you can win Palestinian public opinion over, which it seems to me is vital to the construct you've described for what a successful outcome looks like? Well, I think you heard President Biden articulate that pretty clearly in the State of the Union, which is even if it's something that an Israeli audience doesn't want to hear right now in the near term trauma of the post October 7th world. The reality is, if we're not addressing those long-term factors that contribute to perpetual instability in the West Bank or Gaza, then Israel and Israelis won't have the security that they want to live their lives in Israel. So there needs to be changes in policies by the government in Jerusalem that serve the security of the Israeli people. And part of that is addressing the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Number two, beginning to plan for what the day after in Gaza looks like, because you can't just leave it the way it is and hope for the best. And on the West Bank side, there will need to be attention paid to addressing the economy, addressing the lack of hope of young Palestinians in the West Bank. Their economy is at a standstill. In no way is this a recipe for enduring stability. And I think this is clearly a conversation that is going to become sharper over the course of this year. What I've heard from the Israeli side is Americans assume that some problems have solutions and some problems just don't have solutions. You have to manage them as best you can. Is there a way you think that as somebody who's had any number of conversations with Israeli government officials before and after October 7, is there a way to persuade Israelis that there are solutions to this and solutions will require taking risks now for a long-term benefit, even though the Israeli view is that the risks they took after Oslo neither improved Israelis' lives nor Palestinians' lives. We need to acknowledge the trauma of October 7th and the idea that there would be immediate recognition of a Palestinian state absent reform, anti-corruption, demilitarization, all these issues – 
that's not going to make Israelis feel safe. So first of all, I think we need to think through how we communicate and not dictate to Israel what our report card is for their security. Secondly, I would observe from my conversations with Israelis that, yes, that's what you hear right now. But just like in our government, there's a diversity of views and there's a recognition that perpetual instability, economic strain, lack of opportunity, and no confidence in the government in Ramallah, that doesn't actually serve Israeli security interests. So I think what we need to think about over time is communicating what is good for Israel's security and that the status quo or returning to the status quo ante is not going to be good for Israel's security. By no means am I going to tell you that I think this is easy or quick or straightforward, but this has to be a conversation about Israeli security. And I think any intelligence or military analyst or expert who assesses conditions that are ripe for further violence would look at the situation in the West Bank or Gaza and say, this is not the making for long-term stability. Dana Stroll, thank you very much for joining us on Babel. My pleasure. The war in Gaza poses a multifaceted policy problem for the United States. What are the different dimensions of this problem? There are all kinds of problems. One, the obvious one, is the diplomatic piece. Not only is the United States trying to protect its interests with Israel, it's trying to protect its relationships with Arab states, with states around the world that are offended by what Israel's doing. The world is turning against Israel, and the United States, as a traditional supporter of Israel, is feeling that the task of keeping everybody on side and not isolating the United States in its support of Israel is increasingly challenging. There are, of course, military challenges here, both Israel using American weapons, but also Israel fighting part of an entire axis of resistance that Iran has built up in the region. So there are implications in Lebanon with Hezbollah, there are implications in the Red Sea with the Houthis, there are implications in Iraq and in Syria. And we've seen a number of forces aligned with Iran in this axis of resistance, which includes Hamas, attacking American troops, American interests, as part of their solidarity with Hamas in this war. There's also, I think for the Biden administration, a profound political problem. The Democratic Party is not at all united on how it sees this issue, and, and both with minority communities, people of color, and, and young people, progressives, there's real dismay at U.S. support for Israel. And, and those are communities that if President Biden wants to win re-election in November, he's not only going to have to win their acquiescence, he's going to have to have support in those communities. And the president is trying to find a way to thread the needle between his instinct to support Israel, built over 50 years in American politics, built on mainstream U.S. And, and Democratic support for Israel, feeling more favorable to the Israelis than the Palestinians. That's been true for many decades, but also dealing with important constituencies that he needs in the Democratic Party who are horrified at Israeli actions and say the United States has an important role stopping them. Yeah, and I'll just pick up where you left off, John. I mean, there's a number of senators that are now sort of clamoring for essentially conditionality on Israeli aid because there's a great many restrictions on humanitarian aid to Gaza right now, in addition to a number of the questions about the way that Israel is is carrying out the war. And I think, you know, that leads to sort of operational issues, but operational issues that will have ramifications for the day after for Israel and Palestine, but I also think for the United States for the foreseeable future. I mean, Israel is using things like 2,000 pound bombs on, you know, heavily or densely populated areas. This is something that, you know, the U.S. doesn't really do anymore. And they've decided not to do it, not just for humanitarian reasons or for hearts and minds reasons, but for operational reasons. There are second and third order effects of using those kinds of weapons in densely populated areas. And we're seeing that. You see, you know, sewage and water pipes being ripped out of the ground and then commingling. 
There has been a number of reports talking about if there was a ceasefire today, there would still be thousands more casualties. So Gaza will not recover for a very, very long time. And I think that that's also going to be sort of an open wound that the United States is going to have to deal with for some time. And to be honest, I think a lot of human beings don't recover from something like that. And I think that, you know, dealing with not just Israeli security, but Palestinian security is going to have to be a major question moving forward. Because the more violence we see and the failure to secure both populations, I think the less possibility for peace in the long run, because, you know, not to be trite, but hurt people hurt people. But of course, Um, you know, and and one of the great ironies here is that Israel was largely created by people who had been through profound trauma, not just the Holocaust, but many people have been through violence in the Arab world, that Israel itself is a country that was born in trauma. I think that's part of the reason why the charges of genocide in Gaza are treated so offensively by so many Israelis, because, of course, at the height of the Holocaust, 15,000 Jews a day were being killed. This is a problem of how do we actually get to security? And and I think part of the question that, that American politicians are wrestling with is both what's the appropriate American role and what's the American capability to move this in a different direction. I think uh, Senator Schumer's speech yesterday was, to me, much more interesting than it was reported to be because it was so wrenching. It was so personal. It was about his commitment to Israel. He talked about his name Schumer comes from the Hebrew word Shomer, to guard I think this is an issue, as as Natasha said, that there's a moral element to it that so many supporters of Israel feel, and there's no obvious answer, but it certainly seems, as Dana herself said, that where Israel is going isn't going to get Israel to where it needs to be. Yeah, and I think, I mean, to your point on that in Senator Schumer's speech, which he actually called for early Israeli elections, which was quite, I think, a surprise to a lot of people. But I think the reality is in a situation like this, you really don't need leaders that are going to further exploit trauma and incite violence for their own political ends. I think that's why, you know, some conflicts just never end or they slip into back into conflict at the drop of the hat. I think for the safety of Israelis and Palestinians, and I mean, to be honest, the safety of Arab and Jewish people everywhere You need a leader that's going to try to soothe that trauma and bring their population forward. You know, I mean, and and that's going to be tough. You know, the whole world knows about a black American preacher named Martin Luther King and an African leader named Nelson Mandela because they were extraordinary, not because they were ordinary. But we do need that, I think, moving forward. John, you referenced something that Dana said during the interview, and Dana also said that after Iraq and Afghanistan, the U.S. military came to view victory in terms of winning over the population. Do we see any Middle Eastern militaries taking the same approach? I honestly don't. I think most Middle Eastern militaries I'm familiar with talk about asserting control. That's certainly what we've seen Syria do. You get the acquiescence of people, or they leave. But the idea that people can be converted seems foreign, I think partly because of a contempt for the idea that the people should have a vote, which is really the dominant paradigm in the Middle East. The Israelis, I think, have to think about what the future relationship with Palestinians both is and can be. And it does seem to me that if you conclude that there is no acceptance, there will never be acceptance that leads you to one pathway. I think if you look at the record of the last 75 years, and if you look at the acceptance of Israel before October 7th in many parts of the Arab world, you would draw a different conclusion. But a number of Israeli politicians are convinced that the only conclusion to draw is that Palestinian hostility, Palestinian rejection is a constant, not a variable, and Israel should act accordingly. And I think We see some policies coming out of the current government of Israel that both are premised on that and in many ways reinforce it. I think the point on Middle Eastern militaries is right to a certain degree. But I also see militaries, not just militaries, but some armed groups that we've supported, for example, in Syria, 
sort of changed their tune to a certain degree. I know that the U.S. Army had, or the U.S. military had worked quite a bit with Saudi Arabia, for example, on trying to sort of like reduce civilian harm in Yemen, for example. I think at the end of the day, Saudi Arabia sort of withdrew to a certain degree because it was losing more than anything else. But I, I do see the effects of leverage on certain partners when it comes to like armed groups in Syria who were more than willing actually to engage in training or anything that made them seem more legitimate, not just to their own people, but also to the world more broadly. But yeah, I think unfortunately, John is probably right. There really isn't that acknowledgement of sort of winning the hearts, you know, more broadly across the Middle East. Let's talk about timelines for U.S. government action. The humanitarian needs in Gaza are urgent. The diplomatic tasks are more medium term. And the political aspect of this will take years. But they're deeply intertwined. What can the United States government do to mutually reinforce these priorities, especially with unsettled Israeli politics and a U.S. election in eight months? I think you plant as many seeds as you can. You certainly have to deal with the urgent. But I certainly think that the medium and longer term things, the U.S. role is certainly weakened significantly by what a lot of people consider to be very uncertain outcomes and a likely very different Israel policy under a Trump administration. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's the presumption. And a sense that Israeli politics may be shifting. And maybe some of these issues are, are one of the issues that will emerge, although Benny Gantz is presumed to be the likely victor of a next election. He's pretty hawkish on, I mean, the same Palestinian issues that Benjamin Netanyahu is. And this is, I think, the hardest piece of all of this is you have three relatively weak political leaders in Joe Biden with very uncertain election prospects, Benjamin Netanyahu with a potential end of his term in the coming months, and Mahmoud Abbas at 88 with very little legitimacy and very little capability. And you know, Natasha was talking about the importance of leadership. I don't see much possibility of leadership at all. You could argue that it's moments like this that create leaders, creates opportunities for leadership, certainly creates a need for leaders. But it's hard to see now exactly who those leaders would be, how they would come to power, or let alone how they would all work together to reach shared common goals. It could be that the common goals become further apart rather than closer together. Thanks for joining me, John and Natasha. Thanks for listening to Babel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSIS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. Thank you.